Hi, everybody. Where are my ICTS guys? Can I start? Yes. Okay. Well, hello everyone that is following from home. Let's start our final lecture today. This is our real analysis class, 2021. And this is lecture 15, where we will talk a little bit about absolutely continuous functions. And also about convolutions and approximations of the identity. Okay, so we have a little bit of a long way to go today. This is our last class. I hope you guys are enjoying the course. I see how many of you six here. Hopefully the others will see on video. Let's just uh, do start with a little bit of a review of what we did in the last class. So in the last class, we were investigating the different functions of bounded variation, and we were particularly interested in investigating the differentiability properties that these functions have, right? The classical differentiability. So we ended up proving a result that if a function f, say, from a closed interval a to b, taking values in r, is increasing. So if you give me any increasing function on an interval, Increasing here doesn't have to be strictly increasing in the sense that we discussed in the last class. So give me an increasing function, then f is differentiable almost everywhere, okay, in the, inside the interval. So any increasing function is differentiable almost everywhere in the interval. This is what we proved in the last class. Uh, in particular, any function f of bounded variation in this interval, I'm writing bv. Okay, so if you have a function of bounded variation, we have also seen that a function of bounded variation can be written as the difference of two increasing functions. Okay, So this is an increasing function, this is an increasing function. Both are differentiable almost everywhere. You take the set, the intersection of these two sets, then also f is differentiable almost everywhere. Okay, so any function of bounded variation is differentiable almost everywhere in a, b. Moreover, we have argued that the derivative f prime is an integrable function interval a, b, and, well, okay, in the case of f, in the case of f increasing, as we saw, uh, the integral of f prime of x dx, say from a to b, was bigger than zero, because if f is increasing, f prime is always bigger or equal than zero, but this was less than or equal than f of b minus f of a. We don't have the fundamental theorem of calculus here, okay? So there is no fundamental theorem of calculus for bv functions, okay? Not yet. And you cannot do better than this, okay? This inequality here may be strict. We constructed this example of the contour Lebesgue function which was a function that, you know, at uh, 1 was 1, at 0 was 0, 
and here did something that was flat almost everywhere, okay? So this is an example of a function such that f prime is flat equal to zero almost everywhere. And f of zero is zero, f of one is one, so therefore this does not hold. Uh, and this function is actually increasing and continuous, okay? Okay, so the first pit stop of the lecture today, so today we're gonna go over essentially two things, I mean, or three things, but the, our first stop is to try to remedy, try to correct this little deviation here. You know, we want to make the fundamental theorem of calculus hold, okay? And this brings us to the concept of functions that are absolutely, absolutely continuous functions. The setup is the same. I'm going to take a function f in their interval a, b. So a, b for me here is a closed interval, finite for now, although many of the arguments, many of the reason, reasoning that I will say here, you can consider functions in the whole real line if you want. But let's say, let's take a function f from a int closed interval a to b, taking values in r, okay? This function is said to be absolutely continuous if or any epsilon bigger than zero, there exists delta bigger than zero such that if Let's see, a i, b i, i belonging to n is a disjoint n countable, could be finite or infinite, collection. Of intervals in a, B, okay, so if you take a disjoint and countable collections of intervals in A, B, such that the sum of the measures of these guys, the sum of B, I minus A, I is less than epsilon. So whenever you get collections of, disjoint collection of little intervals whose total measure is less than delta, then the sum of the jumps f of bi minus f of ai in modulus is going to be less than epsilon. Okay. This is the definition of an absolutely continuous function. Okay. For any epsilon that you give me, I can find a delta such that this property holds. You have to take a look at the definition and digest it for a little bit. Think about it, what it means. Uh, but we will see. Okay, so from the directly from the definition, I want to offer you the following consequences, you know, the following basic consequences. That if a function is absolutely continuous, then it is uniformly continuous. Okay? This is just the definition if you just take one little interval. If the distance of bi minus ai is less than a delta, then f of bi minus f of ai is less than epsilon for any interval. So this, is, this means that the function is gonna be uniformly continuous. A second observation is that a function, an absolutely continuous function, is a function of bounded variation. Okay, if a function is absolutely continuous, then it is of bounded variation. So you just have to take a look at the picture, you know? Take your interval a, b, you know? And you give me delta, G oh, sorry, give me epsilon. 
Just say epsilon equals to, I don't know, one. Just take a number, one. For this epsilon, there exists a certain delta bigger than zero. You go ahead and you split your interval a, b into pieces of size at most delta. Split it in a lot of pieces, just making sure that each of these pieces here has length less than delta. Okay? So the total variation in this first piece, since the length of the first piece is less than delta, and you can further split the piece here. You can make a partition inside, but no matter what you make for the partition, the total variation in that piece is going to be less than epsilon for this piece. The total variation here is going to be less than epsilon. Total variation here will be less than epsilon. Total variation in the last piece will be less than epsilon. Total variation in the whole interval will be finite. This is all we wanted to prove, okay? So if a function is absolutely continuous, then it is BV. <coughs> now, in particular, if a function is BV, then it is differentiable, so then F is differentiable almost everywhere, okay? So this is our starting point today. If you have an absolutely continuous function, then it is BV, and therefore it's differentiable in the classical sense almost everywhere. All right. The most basic example of absolutely continuous functions, the basic example, is when you take an integral of a, an integrable function, okay? A basic example is you let a function g be a function in L1 of your interval a, b, and you consider a function, let's say, big G of x to be the integral from a to x of little g. Okay? So if you have an integral from a to x of a little g, then you have already solved in an exercise. So two things happen here. So uh, first, when you try to compute the derivative, if you define big G as the integral of little g, when you try to compute the derivative, g of x plus h minus g of x over h, you end up this being just the integral of 1 over h, and then the integral from x to x plus h of g of y dy. Okay? So when you send this to 0, this is an average, right? This is an average of little g from x to x plus h divided by the length of the interval, the length of the ball that you're taking. Uh, and we have seen by the Lebesgue differentiation theorem, this is the result we proved two classes ago, that this goes to g of x for almost every x in your interval. It just goes back to the value of the function when h goes to 0 for almost every point. This is the Lebesgue differentiation theorem. So therefore, you know, if you define big G as the integral from A to X of a little L1 function, you have that G prime, big G prime is little g almost everywhere. Okay? So this function is differentiable, and the derivative of big G is little g almost everywhere. And the second observation is that this big G here is absolutely continuous according to the definition. You have done this is in an exercise in your homework, right? You have done this in an exercise in the homework because if you, for any integrable function, if I give you an epsilon, there exists a delta such that if you integrate that function on a set, on any measurable set of measure less than delta, the, the whole integral is less than epsilon. This was an, uh, an exercise, a very neat exercise that you should have done in your homework at home. In particular, if this measurable set is a union of intervals, then you get, you recover the definition here. Okay? So this is the basic prototype of an absolutely continuous function. Don't forget this. It's just the integral of, a, of an integrable function, an integral from a to x of an integrable function. Okay, now what we are going to show is that this is everything. This is the only possibility. 
Okay? All the absolutely continuous functions arise in this way. So I guess today's class, since it's the last one, you will see a little bit of how much you learn in this course. We're going to just, at every step, be drawing some of the weapons we developed here. OK, so the first result that I want to prove to you today, let's say, proposition one, is the following. <coughs> Let f from an interval a, b, to R be absolutely continuous. And with F prime, the derivative, being equal to zero almost everywhere. The conclusion is that then F is constant a constant function. If you have an absolutely continuous function with the derivative zero almost everywhere, then this function must be a constant function. Proof. Well, let's do this. OK, so let's prove, let us prove that f of b is equal to f of a. If I can prove that f of b is equal to f of a, I can apply the same argument for any subinterval of a, b. Therefore, I will prove that oh, the function is constant in the interval. Okay, So you can apply the same argument to any interval a to x. OK, so let us do this. So how should we do this? Well, let's see. Um, let me think about a little bit. Um, what we will do, okay, so let's see, let's try. Let epsilon be bigger than zero, be given. Okay, and let delta bigger than zero be the one corresponding to this epsilon from the definition, from the definition of absolutely continuity, okay? From the definition of absolutely continuity. Okay, so give me an epsilon. I can find a delta from the definition of absolutely continuity such that the property holds. But one more thing, I have to use the information that f prime is zero almost everywhere, okay? So what I have here is that, well, okay, so let E, let E contained in the open interval A, B, be the set where Big F is differentiable, okay? So my function is differentiable almost everywhere. So I let E be the measurable set in my interval, the set where F is differentiable. Therefore, I know that the measure of E has to be B minus A. It has full measure. Okay, so for any, for any point X in E, okay, I have a sequence of little h going to 0 such that, I mean, if I take differentiability to the right, so x and x plus h is still contained in the interval a, b, and f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h, this is less than epsilon because of f prime is 0, OK? Uh, and then I can just move this h to the other side and just say that this is less than epsilon h. OK. So any 
x in this set E has this property, that they have a little interval to the right of x, such that this property holds. So what you have here is a, what we called in the last class, a Vitali covering of your set E. What you have here is a Vitali covering of your set E. We know from the result that we proved in the last class that we can get a subcovering by a finitely many disjoint intervals that covers almost everything. So we can find find a finite and disjoint subcover. Let's see. It's not a subcover because it's not going to cover everything. It's going to cover almost everything, but you can find finite and disjoint intervals, say xi, xi plus hi, such that you know this property holds f of xi plus hi minus f of xi is less than epsilon hi. And the sum of the hi's, this is all, this is, these are all disjoint and contained in your interval a, b, and the sum of the hi's, let's say from one to big N, is bigger than, let's say, b minus a, which is the length of the whole interval, minus, say, delta over two. Okay, it's almost the whole thing, I just put a delta over two here. So you have these two conditions. What you do is, okay, then you get two things. If you take this first line and you add up on i from 1 to n, f of xi plus hi minus f of xi, what you get is something which is less than epsilon times the sum of hi's, which is, of course, less than epsilon over the total length of the interval. Let's say it's b minus a. On the other hand, so here you have it, your a, b, and you have here some intervals, say, x1 and then x1 plus h1, blah, 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 xn, xn plus hn. The way that we are defining all of these are closed intervals. That's OK. So in this piece, you have already computed the jumps. Now, what's left, what is left, what is left from the interval has measure, what is left has measure less than delta over two because the sums of these hi's has measure bigger than b minus a minus delta over two. So the piece that it's left is very small, has measure less than delta over two. And this is just a finite union of open intervals if you want. It's just a finite union of open intervals and big N plus one open intervals, if you want, at most, right? Because, yeah, yeah. No, exactly, yeah. So then you have some open intervals whose total measure is at most delta over two. You go here and you apply the definition of absolutely continuity. Okay, so you have a bunch of open intervals whose total length is less than delta over two, which, of course, is less than delta. Therefore, the sum of the jumps of F is less than epsilon over these intervals. Okay, so then you have the sum of, uh, maybe I don't want to, well, maybe you can do this. Maybe we can write just f of sum of uh, these jumps. So maybe I, here I can put, uh, oh, maybe. just write sum of jumps is less than epsilon. Okay, okay. But then you just use, at the end, you just use the triangle inequality because the jump from f of b minus f of a is just going to be f of x1 minus f of a, and then f of x1 plus h1 minus f of x1, and so on. So you have all the jumps here up to b. So by triangle inequality, and this is even applied in the usual way because we just have a finite number of intervals here. By triangle inequality, the jump from A to B is less than or equal than the sum of the jumps in the intermediate steps. OK, 
Okay, so you get that f of b minus f of a is going to be less than or equal than the sum of the jumps in the pieces that are left, say epsilon plus the sum of the jumps in each of these intervals xi to xi plus hi, which is epsilon b minus a. So the difference f of b minus f of a is less than epsilon times something universal. Since epsilon is any positive number, you get that the difference f of b minus f of a has to be zero. And the same argument can be applied to any point x from a to x to any subinterval. So the function has to be constant in the whole place, okay? Absolutely continuous function with the derivative zero has to be the constant function. Okay. So now we are pretty much ready to prove our, you know, corrected version of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So this is my theorem, theorem two. F from an interval a b to r is absolutely, absolutely continuous if and only if the derivative f prime, which I know it exists, belongs to L1 of AB and f of x is equal to f of a plus, let's, let's write it this way, f of x minus f of a is equal to the integral from a to x of f prime of y dy. Okay, so my function is absolutely continuous if and only if the derivative is integrable and the fundamental theorem of calculus holds, okay? This is for any x in the interval a, b. Or here, close. Okay. Um. Let me prove this. Okay. So proof. Let's prove first the this part. Okay? So assume that uh, that you're given uh, <coughs> that you're given a function little g in L1, okay? Assume that you're given a little function little g in L1, and you define and you define the function big F as being a certain number f of a plus the integral from a to x of the function little g. We have already seen this. We have already argued. It was just like here. So if I give a little a a function little g in L1 and define the function big F like this, we have already argued two things. First, by the Lebesgue differentiation theorem, this function F is differentiable almost everywhere, and its derivative is little g. So little g is rightfully called F prime. And also, this function here is absolutely continuous by the exercise in the homework that you did. Okay. So this part is check. So the interesting part now for us is the other way around. So now assume that your function f from a, b to r absolutely con is absolutely continuous. Okay, so if I start now with a function that is absolutely continuous, we, I already know 
absolutely continuous means BV. BV means the derivative exists almost everywhere, and the derivative belongs to L1. Oh, this part checks. The derivative exists almost everywhere, and it belongs to L1. All that I have left to prove is that the, the fundamental theorem of calculus actually holds. Then we argue as follows. OK, so I start with my function big F, which is absolutely continuous. The derivative f prime exists almost everywhere. So I now create a new function. So let's define, so you baptize, create a new function g of x as just being the integral from a to x of this function f prime of y dy. Create this function big G. You want to prove that it essentially is big F. But for now, you don't know. OK, so just let's just create this function. But what do you know with this newly created function? You know that this big G is absolutely continuous because you're integrating an integrable function from A to X. And you know by the Lebesgue differentiation theorem here. You have to appreciate what we are using here in this step. So this class is highly non-trivial if you don't know these things, but you have already collected a bunch of weapons that we are using here freely, okay? And these are non-trivial theorems that we are invoking here. So by the Lebesgue differenti differentiation theorem, you already know that g prime is equal to this function f prime here inside almost everywhere. <laughs> but then you can then consider the function g minus or, or f minus g. Okay, this function, you take the difference of the two. If you take an absolutely continuous function and you add or subtract another absolutely continuous function, you can just check from the definition that the subtraction or the sum of two absolutely continuous functions is still absolutely continuous. Just use a triangle inequality. Uh, so this is absolutely continuous. This is differentiable almost everywhere. This is differentiable almost everywhere. You take this, the intersection of these two sets, so the difference is going to be differentiable almost everywhere. And f minus g prime is going to be f prime minus g prime. g prime is equal to f prime almost everywhere. So this is 0 almost everywhere. So here you have an absolutely continuous function with the derivative being 0 almost everywhere. Hey. This is just the proposition one that we proved. And this is the reason we proved this proposition, otherwise we would not have done it. Okay, so therefore, f minus g is constant. So then by proposition one, f minus g is constant. Okay, now since g of a G of x was defined as the integral from a to x. If you put x equals to a, you're going to be integrating over the empty set from a to a. So this is 0. Since g of a is 0, you get that f of x minus g of x is equal to f of a minus g of a. g of a is 0, so this is just f of a. So here you have it. You move it to the other side, f of x minus f of a is equal to the integral, to, is equal to g, and g is just the integral from a to x. Okay, so here's the end of the proof. So as of now, as of this moment, you know, if somebody comes to you and say, well, the fundamental theorem of calculus, if you assume that a function is c1 in the interval, then the fundamental theorem of calculus holds. And then you should say, yes, you can assume that the function is c1 in the interval, but you don't need that much. It holds the same way if you just assume that your function is absolutely continuous in the interval. And actually, this is the weakest possible assumption. It's if and only if. Okay, so your fundamental theorem of calculus holds if and only if your function is absolutely continuous in the interval. Is that clear? I want to hear. Yes, Good. Because now we move to the last 
chapter of our course. We still have class today might be a little bit longer. But we are going to finish today. And again, with the same philosophy, everything that you prove in this course, every new theorem that you learn, that you learn the proof, okay? So all the theorems in this course, you should understand the statement very carefully. You should read the proof, understand the proof, take a look and realize what are the core points in each proof. Why does it work? Why, if I remove this assumption, it does not work? Why, if I remove that assumption, it does not work? You understand the result. You don't have to memorize the proof. It's OK if you just, once in your life, read and understand. But the most important thing is that you collect that result and learn how to apply. OK? So we have been discussing <coughs> some time ago in this class the importance for some results in analysis of these dense subclasses, right? So in some problems, I ask you to prove something for all the integrable functions. And then you realize, oh, well, maybe I just have to prove for continuous functions, or maybe even for step functions, and then use somehow a density argument. Maybe for step functions, you just have to prove for one step function, for a characteristic function of an interval, if your problem is linear. So a problem which would be much more difficult just uh, <coughs> reduces to proving such things for one interval. Okay. So this concept of approximating functions by other classes of functions, by easier classes of functions, is very important in analysis, right? Sometimes in your future, if you end up studying analysis or PDEs or probability or dynamical systems, it will be important for you if somebody gives you a very rough function, a very crazy function, and asks you to prove a certain statement about that function, and you say, well, this is too much a rough function. Can I regularize that function? Can I consider first a smoother function, prove the result that I have to prove, and then somehow approximate this rough function that you asked me to prove before? Okay. And one way to smooth things in analysis is to take averages. You know? Averaging something is a smoothing operator. If you get something which highly oscillates, a function that is very oscillating, and you say, OK, let me take, let me fix a ball of radius 1, and around every point, let me average the function over a ball of radius 1. If you try to graph this, you see that the, the average that you took has less oscillation. If around each point you take an average, it, this is a less oscillatory object than the original one. So this is, this is a smoother object. You know. And this concept of averaging is intrinsically connected to the definition of this, what we call convolution operator. So if I give you two functions, f and g, let's say these are functions in Rd, okay, taking real values. I will define the convolution of f with g, and this is the note with the little asterisk, f convolution with g at the point x will be the integral over the whole space Rd of f of x minus y dy. Okay. Well, if the integration is in y, the point x is fixed. Okay, f convolved with g at the point x is the integral of f of x minus y, g of y, dy. If you want, you could change the variables here. You can call, you know, x minus y to be a z, and this is going to be equal the same way as you want uh, f of y, g of x minus y, dy. OK, just by a change of variables. So the way you should look at this object is that, so pay very much attention now. 
The way that you should look at this object is that you are averaging your function f by this, func by this function g. This, this function g plays the role of the weight. So this is a weighted average, you know. You are around that point x, you fix your point x, and around that point x, you're going to collect f of x minus y with mass given by g of y, and you're going to integrate this thing, okay? So in essence, this object here averages one function with weights coming from the other function. And this is a symmetric view. You can view this as averaging g with weights in f by this thing. Now, you should, at, you should at this point stop me and say, well, Emmanuel, this doesn't make sense to me. How do you know that this thing is integrable? How do you know that this thing is even finite? You know, you're correct. This is not necessarily true. To guarantee that this is actually well-defined, finite, at least almost everywhere, we will have to impose some decay conditions on f and g. Okay, as we will see in a little bit. So we, we're going to have to assume that this f has some decay and this g has some decay given by some LP space. So f is going to be in certain LP, g is going to be in some LQ, and then under these conditions, this will be a well-defined object. But wait a little bit before we get into that point. Just from the definition, I mean, there are some very basic properties. So let me call this proposition three are the basic properties. Okay. So for now, assume that uh, everything is well defined. Okay. Assume that everything is well defined. Okay. At least if your functions are non-negative, you can always integrate non-negative functions. You can always do this. The answer might be infinity. For any point x, the answer might be infinity. That's fine, but you can integrate. But let's just assume that everything is well defined. So a few properties that you can see directly from the definition is that, well, one of them I already uh, wrote here, right? So this is a bilinear. So this operator here is, is bilinear and symmetric. Symmetric in the sense that f convolved with g is g convolved with f. You can see from here. And bilinear, if I just take uh, f1 plus f2 and convolve with g, the integral splits. It's f1 convolved with g plus f2 convolved with g. So it's linear in each of the entries. You can sum and you can multiply by scalars. OK. What else? Let me peek at my notes just to guarantee that I won't forget any of the basic properties. If I have this uh, bilinear and symmetric, it's also associative. So F convolved with G convolved with H is equal to F convolved with G convolved with H. Okay. So be very careful that the convolution of two functions is a new function. It's not a number, OK? This is a new function that at the point x gives me this value. OK? So bilinear symmetric, associative. Uh, now, so if, if, if I define the, the translation operator, let's say tau, tau of w at the function f of, of x being just defined by x minus, ta minus w. So if I consider translation by this vector w, you have tau w of f convolved with g is just equal to tau w of f convolved with g. So this, it, it behaves well under translations. Right? This is this is kind of clear, because if you consider the translation of this thing by a vector w, this means that this is f convolved with g at the point x minus w, according to the definition. And then at the point x minus w, just put x minus w in the place of x here. Okay? And this is just the, well, you check the form. This is just the translation by w of f at the point x. This is pretty much 
reasonable. And the, sec the fourth one, which is kind of important, is that if A is this set, is the set of X plus Y, such that X belongs to the support of F, and Y belongs to the support of G. Just take any function in the support of F, any point in the support of F, any point in the support of G, consider the set which is the formed by the sum of these points, X plus Y, and you take the closure of this. The closure with respect to the usual topology in RD. Okay, so if A is the closure of this set, then the convolution is supported in this set A. Okay? Of course, if this closure is the whole IRD, there's nothing to do. But the, the interesting case is when F has compact support, F has support, has bounded support, and G has bounded support too. And then essentially, the support of F convolved with G will have to be contained in this set A, which is also is going to be bounded. In essence, because if you're not in this set A, if, if a point Z is not in this set A, then Z cannot be written as X plus Y, or even approximated by point X plus Y. Okay? Therefore, I mean, at this point, if, 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 your point, if you want to evaluate the convolution at the point Z, one of these two, z minus y or y, will always be zero. And you'll be integrating only zeros. You'll never pick up any mass, okay? Just think about this for a little bit. Okay. So this is a good way with convolutions to recognize this additive structure here that appears in the integral, you know? So these points are adding up to x. These two points that are integrating here are adding up to a value of x. So this is a y, and if this is a z, this is a y plus z is equal to x. You have an exercise in your homework now to think about this. Okay, so these are the basic properties of the convolution operator. Now, Why do we care about this? Well, this is a regularizing or a smoothing operator. Okay. You should always have in mind that the convolution only in proves the regularity of a function, okay? So as a rule of thumb, as a guideline, as a broad guideline, you should think about that the convolution of two functions is at least as regular as each of them, okay? It gets the regularity of the best of them if you have one that is better than the other one, okay? So for example, let me give you a basic example of this. If you have a function f, which is, let's say, ck of compact support in Rd, so the function is ck of compact support in Rd, and uh, a function g, which is merely L1 lock, so it's just locally integrable in Rd. So this f convolved with g will be also CK. Will not have support, compact support anymore, so be careful. But it will be CK. So if a function, if one of the functions has some derivatives, the derivatives will move. In this, and also, the derivative of order alpha of F convolved with G, if alpha is a multi-index here, so you're working in RD, so you may take a, alpha one derivatives in the variable x1, alpha two derivatives in the variable x2, so we call this a multi-index alpha. This is actually the alpha of f convolved with g. 
Okay? So in other words, the derivative moves inside the convolution. Okay? Don't forget that this is not for free. This is also due to a theorem that you have learned in this course. Usually the mechanism to prove that this is the case is the Lebesgue dominated convergence theorem. Okay, so this is a, an application of dominated convergence. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at the, as the proof say, let's just say we are in a one dimension. Let's say we are in dimension one. Let's just see what happens. So you have this convolution of F convolved with G. Uh, and let's see, let's say that F is, F is say, C1 of compact support, okay? Let me just argue with this. And G is locally integrable. And I want to investigate the derivative of this. So this is going to be F convolved with G of X plus H minus F convolved with G to point X divided by H, okay? So this would be the derivative. Limit when H goes to zero of this object. I want to see if this exists. Then you write down, this is one over H, and then what is F convolved with G at this point? Well, it's the integral. The integral takes place in R of F of X plus H minus Y, G of Y, DY. What about this other one? This is minus. Well, this is just F convolved with G at the point X. So this is F of X minus Y, G of Y, DY. Okay, so now what do you do? Well, the integral is linear, so this is just going to be the integral in R of F of X plus H minus Y, minus F of X minus Y, over H, whole thing, G of Y, Now you want to take the limit, you know, when h goes to zero of a, an integral inside. You want to move the limit inside the integral. To move the limit inside the integral, you have to use one of these convergence theorems. You just have two, okay? You just have monotone convergence and dominated convergence. Oh, professor, in another book I saw there are other five. No, no, you just have two, just these two, okay? If you cannot solve with these two, then all the others are kind of variations of these two. So here, there's no sort of monotonicity going on. Okay, everything is floating around. So the only one that you can use is dominated convergence. Okay, so just sit down and argue, why is this thing dominated, you know? Why is this thing here dominated? Let's see. Well, my F has compact support, you know? And I'm saying it's C1 of compact support. So all of these so different bonded. quotients, they are bounded. Yes, you have this... Uh, mean value mean value inequalities, right? So you can use this sort of mean value inequalities. Right, that f of uh, x plus h minus y minus f of x minus y. This is less than the supremum of f prime times the length of the interval times h, okay? So then, if I divide this by H, I will divide this by H, and this will cancel. Okay, so this is all bounded by the supremum of F prime. Well, if F is C1 of compact support, this means that the derivative is C0, continuous of compact support. If it's continuous of compact support, F prime has, is bounded. So this is bounded independent of H, okay? And also, this integrates just when Y your function f has compact support. So if the support here is f, if, the f uh, if this is the support of f, certain set k, okay? And then even if you put uh, x plus h, if you say h has radius one, you will increase your support by a little bit. Let's say this is k plus y, k plus h, where h uh, has norm less than one, okay? Then this, this integral, will only take place when y gets in this bigger domain. You know, if not, I mean, if. Uh, this is, well, okay, so this is translated in x. So your x is fixed. So you fix your x, okay? 
So this whole integral is not over the whole r, it's just over a bounded piece of r. So you translate this whole thing here by x instead of this being the origin. This is your point x. And this interval here just is just, this, this is just known zero if y is in this bounded neighborhood around the point x, such that x minus y is in the original neighborhood k of the beginning, right? So this is a bounded function, and you're going to integrate, your point x is fixed, this is bounded by some number m, times the function g on a certain big ball, you know? g is locally integrable, I'm telling you that the function g was locally integrable. So here you have it, your, your dominating, your majorant, you know, it's just g times the characteristic function of this big ball where all the action happens times this, this number m that bounds this. This is dominated, okay, so then by the dominated, dominated convergence theorem, theorem, you can move your limit inside the integral, okay? Once you move your limit inside the integral, then the limit of this when h goes to zero is just f prime. So you end up proving that this is f prime convolution with g at the point x, as you wanted, right? And then by a repeated number of applications of the same principle, you can take as many derivatives as your function f allows, right? So this is for any multi-index alpha with size less than k, if your function f is ck. If your function f is c infinity of compact support, you can do this all the time, so your convolution will be c infinity as well, okay? So as a guideline, convolution will always get the regularity of the smoother of the functions, okay? You have to be a little bit careful if you don't assume that your function has compact support. Then you will have to, instead of using this here, you have to adjust. For example, if you assume that your function f is Schwartz, if it's a Gaussian, it still holds, but you have to argue properly how the dominated convergence theorem is applied, okay? There are no shortcuts, okay? So be careful when you do these arguments. Be careful what you're using, okay? If you know that you have to use something, just sit down and argue properly. Some of you in the exams, I know that you have the right ideas for to solve the exam, problems in the exam or in the homework. You have the right ideas, so when you have the right idea to do, sit down and write properly. There's a lot of room for you to improve your mathematical writing with clarity, with the details, with the relevant details. I know as a student it's not so easy to find what is the right amount of detail? Should I be very loose or should I write too much? Well, you adjust over time and you'll find just the right amount of detail to convince the reader on the other side that you know that problem, you know? Okay, good. So we have seen some basic properties of the convolution operator. We have seen it, why is it useful for in the sense of regularizing the functions, okay? The final part of this lecture, by the way, I don't expect you to learn all of these things in one hour, all about convolution in one hour. You will have to sit down, write down this definition, take a look at it for a couple of hours, prove all these properties by yourself, convince yourself that it works, redo these arguments, solve the homework exercises, keep working on this. If this is the first time in your life that you see this, you'll still see many other times, don't worry, okay? But this is an important concept, important concept in analysis, a lot. Uh, I want now to discuss three core results, or maybe four core results about these things. Uh, let's first understand when is this bounded, when is this well-defined, okay? So this, this is the first theorem that I want to show you today. What's the number in here? Theorem three. Maybe if that's proposition three, this would be theorem four of the class today. Okay, so let me, let me state it this way. Ah, so okay, so let uh, one over P plus one over Q 
be equal to one. And in principle, you have p and q between one and infinity, okay? So these are These are conjugate exponents, uh, could be one and infinity. So if f belongs to LP of RD and g belongs to LQ of RD, then uh, f convolved with g is bounded Particularly, it's very well defined and uniformly continuous. This is a marvelous result. If you get a function in LP and G in, in LQ with conjugate exponents, the functions don't need to be continuous. They could be crazy functions. The convolution will be bounded, uniformly bounded, and uniformly Continuous, so you make the convolution of two crazy functions to be better, okay? So the convolution gets the regularity of the functions when they have regularity, but even when they don't, convolution can create regularity. Moreover, if, uh, if both exponents here are not infinity, Do I need this? Yes, I need this. We have that uh, f convolved with g belongs to a space which we call C0 of Rd. Okay, so this is, this is the subspace of continuous functions. that go to zero as your point x goes to infinity. Okay. So if, you, if you're taking convolution of two functions with conjugate exponents, none of which is infinity, this will not only be continuous, but will go to zero uh, at infinity. Okay, this is, it doesn't, Okay, so be a little bit careful. This, this space that I'm calling here C0 of Rd, this is not functions of compact support, okay? So these are functions that tend to zero at infinity. For example, a Gaussian is a function that doesn't have compact support, but it belongs to this space, okay? Okay, let us prove this result. So let's bring our weapons to the table. Uh, first, how do I show that the function is bounded? Well, f convolved with g at the point x is equal to the integral of f of x minus y, d of y, dy. One thing I can do here is use Holder's inequality. Okay? So the modulus of this is equal to the modulus of this. And by Holder's inequality, this loses to the integral of f of x minus y to the p to y to the 1 over p, and then the integral of p of y to the q dy to the 1 over q, okay? Well, x here is a fixed point, so this is just a translation. Lebesgue measure is translation invariant, so this is just the LP norm of f, and this is the LQ norm of G, since f belongs in LP and g belongs in LQ, this is a fixed number that bounds uniformly for all the x. So this proves that my function is bounded. And the L infinity norm, if you want, the L infinity norm of the convolution loses to the LP norm of f times the LQ norm of g.
Let's do the second part. Oh, the second part is beautiful. Let's see. Let's assume, so assume that, let's see what we have to assume here. Maybe I want to assume that one is less than or equal to p, less than infinity. Okay? You can always assume that, that one of them is not infinity. Okay? So if, if p is equal to infinity, you change rows with q below, okay? You change the rows of p and q. But let's just assume without the loss of generality that p is less than infinity. What do you do? Well, I want to show that it's uniformly continuous. Okay, so what I want is to investigate f convolution with g, say at the point x minus w minus f of x, f convolution of g at the point x. Let's write what this is. Okay, so this is, I've told you, if you want, you can write it like this. You can write it, this is actually tau translation of by w of f convolved with g minus convolved with g point x. which is less than or equal, which is actually equal, let's just see, of uh, translation, you can move it inside here, translation by f convolved with g at the point x minus f convolved with g at the point x. And this one, you can actually this use the linearity, so this is this minus f, involved with G at the point X. Okay, everything that you did here, you, you could have just written the integral of this thing. So you would have found this thing here. This is this, X minus Y, uh, G of Y, dy, okay? So this is just this thing. At this point, you can use holder again, just like we used there. So this loses to oh, LP norm of this guy, times the LQ norm of G. Now, it was one of the exercises in your homework too, not homework number two, but it was one of your exercises in the homework to prove that the translation operator is continuous in LP when P is not infinity. So when P is not infinity, if you take the function F and the function translation of f by a vector w, in the norm p, this goes to zero as w goes to zero, okay? This is one typical exercise that you prove first for continuous functions, and then you extend for general functions in LP. I hope you did this exercise. So then, this, this is the translation in the LP norm. This goes to zero. This is a fixed number. So this goes to zero as w goes to zero uniformly, because now here at this point, you don't depend on your point x anymore. So this goes to zero uniformly in x. It doesn't matter which x you start it. Okay, so the function is uniformly continuous. So we are using here in this class a lot of the stuff that you have already, or you are supposed to have already, proved, saw, digested, and learned how to use before we reach to this point. Okay, so translation goes, and this is important, why we, this is why we need P less than infinity, okay? Because if P is infinity, the translation is not continuous in the L infinity norm. Now, we have only the last part missing, that, okay, if one is less than, P and Q is less than infinity, if this both are not one or infinity, the convolution goes to zero uh, when your point tends to infinity. Well, then in this case, let's do this. Okay, so now if both of these guys are between one and infinity strictly, you can choose, choose a sequence Fn, let's say continuous of compact support, function continuous of compact support, 
in RD, GN continuous of compact support in RD, such that F minus Fn in the norm P goes to zero, G minus GN in the norm P in the norm Q goes to zero. I want the sequence to have compact support, so I cannot do this when the numbers P and Q are infinity. Okay, so both of them cannot be infinity. Since they are conjugates, then both of them can, one of them cannot be one. Okay. So I can get sequences of functions of compact support uh, such that this goes to zero. So this means that I give an epsilon bigger than zero. Uh, you choose uh, n zero such that uh, for n bigger than n zero, these numbers is less than epsilon, norm p, and this number, norm q is less than epsilon. Now what you do? Well, you try to do f convolved with g of a point x, and you do minus fn convolved with gn at the point x. So you do this. And then you add and subtract one here. So let's use the triangle inequality here. So this is F convolved with G, point X, minus Fn convolved with G, point X, plus this term here that you introduced, minus Fn. Yeah. So take a look at what's behind here. We already know since Fn and Gn have compact support, the convolution Fn with Gn will have compact support because of that basic property number four, okay? So this, has, this is a function of compact support. If I show that this is small for x outside of a big ball, then I will be done because all I want to show is if x is outside a big ball, this is small. So let's argue. So this is for a point x, this is less than or equal than the sum of these two guys. I add and subtracted this one. And then here, I use the linearity, as I used before three times. I, I break f minus fn, so I have f minus fn norm p, and then g norm q, plus uh, fn norm p, g minus gn norm q. Okay, so this I'm choosing to be less than or equal than epsilon. Don't Q. And this uh, Fn, well, the Fn's norm P, the difference is less than epsilon, so I, this, this will certainly be my triangle inequality less than the norm P plus one, let's say, if epsilon is smaller than one, uh, times this, which is less than epsilon. Okay, uh, so you see that this is uniformly bounded. For any point x, this is uniformly bounded by this number, okay? Since epsilon is arbitrary, you know, and so, so what you should do now is that, okay, uh, you are essentially done there. So you end up proving, you end up proving that this implies that uh, f convolved with g at the point x is going to be less than uh, epsilon times this number, epsilon times something, uh, for 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 x for x not belonging to this support of f, let's say, n0 plus convolved with gn0, which is a compact set. For x not belonging in this set, call it kn0. n0 was the n0 associated to this epsilon. You fixed n0, fix that guy, that's fine. You already have these things. And then for x outside of this compact, this function here will be 0. Therefore, f convolved with g will be less than epsilon times this these things here, constant, okay? So this is what you wanted to show, that for any, for any epsilon, 
you can find a big ball such that outside of that big ball, your function is less than epsilon, or epsilon times 100. So this function goes to zero as your x goes to infinity. OK. Very nice result. This is one of the highlights. I mean, this class today is also one of the highlights of this course, OK? So functions in conjugate exponent, function in conjugate LPs, the convolution is going to be uniformly continuous. And if the exponents are not infinity, it will actually go to 0 uh, when your point goes to infinity. Prove that this, actu this is actually necessary. Prove that if one of the exponents is infinity, then your function may not go to 0 at infinity. Okay? What happens if you take the convolution of an L1 function with an L infinity function? Prove that the, this result does not hold. OK. In fact, you have a very nice inequality, you know? We have been using Holder's inequality already three or four times here. I mean, to bound the L infinity norm by the LP times the LQ norm of the function. In fact, there is another inequality which we call Young's inequality. There are four important, or maybe a few important inequalities that we have seen in this class, right? We have seen Holder's inequality. We have seen Minkowski's inequality, which is the triangle inequality. We have seen Jensen's inequality. We have seen perhaps also Chebyshev's inequality for the distribution of an LP function. This is another one that you should remember from this class. Young's inequality for convolutions. And it's very simple. So let 1 less than or equal to p, q, and r less than or equal to infinity, such that 1 plus 1 over r is equal to 1 over p plus 1 over q. This is the relation. Then the convolution of two functions, f convolved with g, in the LR norm loses to the LP norm of f times the LQ norm of g. We have been using the case r infinity and p and q conjugate, which is just Holder's inequality, as we applied three times. The general case, I'll let you read in the notes I wrote. It's a five-line five proof. It's just to decompose this convolution properly and apply Holder's inequality with three terms. Okay? I won't do this now to not lose, to advance a little bit on the time. But have this in mind. This is very important. Take a look at the proof of this from the notes that I sent you. Okay? This is just a basic application of Holder's inequality wisely. But if you have two functions, so, so this is in particular, if you have functions f and g with f and g in any LP that you want, then uh, satisfying this thing, of course, then this function f convolved with g will be finite almost everywhere. Okay, As long as 1 over p plus 1 over q adds up to something which is bigger or equal than 1, right? Because you need to have this relation here. You cannot just put... OK, so if p is infinity and infinity, you get 0 on this side. You don't get to make this work, OK? But as long as 1 over p plus 1 over q is bigger or equal than 1, then you get room for r. So this function belongs to LR. In particular, it's finite over almost everywhere. OK. In the last few minutes of the lecture today, I want to discuss with you a little bit more about this averaging process, a process that we call approximations of the identity. Okay, so my setup here will be the following. So let uh, phi be a function 
from Rd, it can value some R, okay? And for epsilon bigger than zero, let us define this function phi epsilon of x. So whenever I say phi epsilon in this lecture now, I will mean phi epsilon of x is going to be one over epsilon to the d phi of x over epsilon. Uh, the camera is not moving. Oh. Camera, please move. Okay, I think the camera is here now. Is that fine? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let me start over. Let phi be a function in Rd, and for any epsilon, we are going to write phi epsilon of x as being this change of variables here. Phi of x over epsilon divided by one over epsilon to the d. This is the dimension here. What's important to know about this thing is that two things. So if phi is a function in L1, if it's an integrable function, the integral in Rd of this function phi epsilon of x, let's compute. This is the integral of 1 over epsilon to the d phi of x over epsilon dx. You change your variables. You call x over epsilon, you call it y. Then in Rd, your dx is going to be over epsilon to the d is going to be dy. So what you end up is the integral of phi of y dy is the same thing. So this, this, this change of variables here does not change the integral of phi, okay? This is a dilation with the proper constant factor here that does not change the integral of phi for any parameter epsilon. So the integrals of these functions, they remain the same. Okay, so look at this fact. Don't forget this. Second important thing that you should know is, so the mass of this function, so imagine yourself now in a situation where this function phi is non-negative, for example, and the integral of this phi is, is 1, okay? And let's just say for simplicity that my phi is, uh, is of compact support. Okay, suppose you are in a situation like this. You have a function phi which is doing a, a little compact support here. So this is an RD. And the integral has average 1, no, has, has integral 1, has total mass is 1. Now, you have seen that when you move to this phi epsilon, Okay, so let's just say, say in the ball, say that the support is in the ball of radius one. So suppose this is the ball of radius one in Rd, okay? Phi epsilon is just defined by this thing. So if my original phi lives in the ball of radius one, phi epsilon lives where? You guess? So this lives when x over epsilon is in the ball of radius one. So this leaves when your x is less than epsilon, in the ball of radius epsilon. Okay, so if this is the picture of phi, if you start with the picture of phi in the ball of radius one, your phi epsilon lives, if epsilon is small, this is the ball of radius one, and this is epsilon, your phi epsilon is gonna live in this ball of radius of radius epsilon. But we have already seen that the mass, the total mass, the L1 mass, the integral below the graph, remains untouched. So you have a function like this, and the phi epsilon will be, when epsilon goes to zero, when epsilon tends to zero, this factor here becomes very big. This is one over epsilon to the D. It becomes a big factor, so your function will do like this. To keep the mass, but have the compact support less. And as, as you send your epsilon to zero, this behavior will be intensified. So the functions will contract their mass and will be, get bigger, you know? The mass below the graph will be always one, 
and the supports going to be tending into small. This is not only if the function has compact support. Of course, the function may have mass all over in RD, but when you send epsilon, when you consider these functions phi epsilon, when epsilon go, go into zero, you are concentrating the mass in the origin. Okay, so this is my message to you. As epsilon goes to zero, you concentrate the mass at the origin. Dirac function, I see. Yes. It converges, then it converges to Dirac function. So your function phi epsilon tries to be, tries to be what we call a Dirac delta. Okay? It tries to be a Dirac delta. Sometimes you listen around in physics. Oh, take the Dirac delta function and so on. So this Dirac delta function is a function. Let's just play a little bit here informally. It would be a function such that delta of x is going to be, let's say, 1 when x is 0 and 0 otherwise. Let's just call it delta of y. Let's call it this. So if you were to take a convolution of f, with this Dirac function at the point x, this will be the integral of x minus y, delta y dy. But then delta only sees the value of y when y is 0, which means that when y is 0, this gives me the value 1. Uh, and it's then it's I have 1 times f of x. So this would be f of x. So essentially, taking the convolution with the Dirac doesn't change the value of the function. goes back to the original function. Of course, being mathematicians, you should know that this Dirac function is, is not exactly a function. It's, in fact, a measure. Yeah, a okay, This is a measure. It's OK to talk about the Dirac measure. It's a measure on the Lebesgue measurable sets. If the point 0 is there, the measure of the set is 1. If the point 0 is not there, the measure of the set is 0. Okay, uh, And you could still integrate the function f of x minus y against this measure here. You can call d delta y. That would be OK. This would give you this thing. That's fine. So the point I want to make is that this phi epsilon, so if you start with, if you fix your function phi in the beginning and send, try to send your epsilon to, to zero, any function phi epsilon that you start will try to become a Dirac delta. And this is a very, very useful and important way to recover your original function you will get back, so we want to understand our goal now. OK, so if my functions phi epsilon want to become the Dirac delta, when I take f convolved with phi epsilon, this should go, this should be f. OK, this should tend to f pointwise or in some sense. OK, but th this is where the gold lives. Because you may start with a function f that is crazy. And then if you take the convolution with, with any of these phi epsilons, if you start with the function phi, which is great, c infinity of compact support, for example, start with the function phi that is c infinity of compact support, no negative has mass 1. Well, any of these phi epsilons will be c infinity of compact support as well. So these functions will be c infinity. You will approximate f by c infinity functions, by smooth functions, by regular functions. So this is a very useful way to approximate your function f, which could be crazy, by some very smooth functions. Now, I haven't told you properly. We are mathematicians. We have to make this approximation precise. Professor, how you are approximating? You are approximating pointwise, pointwise everywhere point-wise almost everywhere. You are approximating some norm. You have to tell me. We have to discuss. We have to prove things, you know? So this is just a heuristic argument, okay? This wants to be a delta function. Therefore, this would like to be your function f when epsilon goes to 0. But we have to discuss how. Okay. And this is the last two results that I have written in your set of notes, which are very important. The first one is about LP convergence 
And the second one, which is a bit harder to prove, is about pointwise convergence. Let's discuss them here. Let me discuss just one of them and show you how beautiful it is. Theorem six. Let me write down for you right here. Okay, so let phi be a function in L1 of Rd with the integral of phi in Rd being a certain number a. Okay, you don't have to have integral 1. You could have the integral being 2, 10, 100, 0. I mean, and then you just normalize. If your integral is a, your function will try to be not the delta, but a times delta. That's perfectly fine. So the most important, more important cases are the cases when a is 1 or the cases when your function has average 0, has integral 0, OK? OK, so then the following statements hold. First, if f belongs to LP of Rd, Okay, and here it's one less than or equal than p, not infinity. I'm not including infinity. You'll see why. Then f convolution with this phi epsilon minus a times f. So I have to multiply by a. This in the LP norm tends to zero. So the limit when epsilon goes to zero. Second one, if f is bounded and uniformly continuous, then this also holds in the L infinity norm. Let us take a look at this result. OK, so this is the LP convergence. Approximation, this is what we call approximations of the identity. Convolution with these kernels, phi epsilon, when epsilon goes to 0, tries to approximate the identity. Okay. So here I'm going to show to you that if you start with a function in LP, at least in the LP norm, this function converges to this function. Let's try to do this. So this is a very beautiful proof. I'm going to prove one, I guess, here, and I'm going to leave two for you to read in the notes. Uh, but let's take a look here what happens. So let's write down f convolution with the phi phi epsilon of x minus a f of x. So this is the integral of f of x minus y, phi epsilon of y dy. And the first step in the proof is that you have to acknowledge that I'm going to write this f of x here times a in a funny way. This is going to be integral of f of x times phi epsilon of y dy in Rd. So f of x is just a constant here, and I'm here just integrating phi epsilon. Phi epsilon, I know that the integral doesn't change. So if the integral of phi is a, the integral of phi epsilon for any epsilon is a as well. I'm just, I've just written in this way so I can put them together. So this is, this is the integral of Rd of f of x minus y minus f of x uh, times this phi epsilon of y dy. OK, phi epsilon, let's try to change the variables here. So let me just write what phi epsilon already is here. 1 over epsilon to the d, phi of y over epsilon. Again, 
I've seen this many times in my life, so this is why I, I'm doing it a, a bit fast here. But if you're doing this for the first time, don't worry if you don't get it yet. Go back home, read the notes, do a lot of exercises, sleep, wake up, do a lot more of exercises, sleep, wake up, and keep doing this for 365 days. You will learn, okay? Let's change the variables here. Let's call y to be epsilon w. So this is going to become integral over rd, f of x minus epsilon w minus f of x. And then here, you just have d of uh, w dw. That is great. So this is a pointwise thing, OK? Now, I want actually to compute the LP norm of this thing. OK, so then, let me just write this in this format. So this is going to be the integral of RD of, this is the translation, right? So we call this translation by a vector E epsilon w of f minus f, the point x. Uh, am I correct? Yes, yes. P of w, dw. The integral is in w here. x is my variable. OK. So therefore, <laughs> therefore, let's compute the LP norm. Let's compute the LP norm of this thing. E comp convolved with phi epsilon minus AF LP norm. Well, we just, uh, we just expressed here the pointwise value. So what we have to do now is to take the absolute value, raise this to the P power. Okay, so this is equal to, we take this, we wrote the pointwise value here as this. This is the pointwise value. You're integrating in Rd. You take the modulus. This is a function of x. You raise to the p power. You integrate in x. And you take this whole thing to 1 over p. OK. This is what you have. You want to show that this goes to 0 when epsilon goes to 0. What you have to do now maybe you don't see it yet, but you will see in a minute, is to use the triangle inequality. Professor, triangle inequality, I don't see any numbers there, any. Yes, you have to use the triangle inequality for integrals, which is sometimes called Minkowski's inequality. And I will show you how to use this. So let's take a, a, a little bit of a detour and go back and discuss a little bit of Minkowski's inequality in a way that you will never forget in your life. Well, at least this is how I remember. I, I always forget, but then I always remember it this way. And the style is like this. So what's the triangle inequality for you? Well, the triangle inequality that we proved, that we called Minkowski's inequality, was for the triangle inequality in the LP space. You told me that if I got two functions, f plus g, and take this LP norm, this would be less than the integral of f, the LP norm of f, plus the LP norm of g. This was what we call the triangle inequality, which this is what you're supposed to know. That's OK. If instead of two functions, I take three, you will agree with me that the things break down. If I take n any number of functions, f1, f2, up to fn, this will be less than or equal than the LP norm of f1 plus LP norm of f2, blah, 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 plus the LP norm of fn. OK, professor, I believe. That's fine. Now, this is just a sum from n, let's say big N here. This is just a sum from 1 to n of a functions fn. Is less than or equal than the sum of functions fn, b, n from 1 to big N. Well, OK, 
okay, what if I don't like to put the n in the bottom, but I like to call my functions f, I like to put the n here as a second entry. That's fine. We won't fight because of that. That is fine. Now, the sum, the sum is an integral. A sum is an integral over the natural numbers with the counting measure, okay? So you can think about the sum as being the integral over a certain space, omega two, of a function, d, when you're integrating with this thing. So just, just call it omega two, the natural numbers, and this new be the counting measure. So what you have is this thing here, f of, this is your y, lp, and the u of y. Here you have it, but the integral in LP, everything started in the LP of a certain space, omega one with a measure mu. So this is just the integral over omega one of whatever is inside, integral over omega two of a function f of x, y of two variables, d nu y to the p, d mu of x raised to one of a p, it's less than or equal than the integral omega two of the LP norm inside. So this is just the integral omega one of f of x y to the p d mu of x. The one over p d mu of y. Okay, and what's written here? is what we call Minkowski's inequality. Or integrals. Okay, you showed me a very nice way to not forget it. I won't never forget it, but I would like still to see a proof. Well, I put this in the homework for you to prove this. But I can actually give you a proof right now if you want, which will reinforce my point that you guys know a lot of things by now. Okay? So let me, let's try to prove this. For any two measure spaces, omega one and omega two with measures mu and nu. Okay? This is the Minkowski's inequality for integrals. Well, let's go back to this point. Up to this point here, it's proof, or at least a proof in three lines of this. The LP norm of the integral of omega two of f of this thing here, by the duality statement, okay? So I am in the space LP of omega one, okay? By the duality statement, this is the supremum over all Gs in LP prime of omega one with the norm P prime one of the integral in omega one of this function. Times this function G against the measure. We have seen how to express the norm as a supremum of multiplicating, multiplying my function here by a function in the dual space. Now you have a function here of two variables. You can use Fubini. Okay, so this is by duality. Now you use Fubini. Well, you can just do a first step, which is to, this is less than or equal than the supremum of blah, 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 blah. Maybe we should do this. It's less than or equal than the supremum of everything here with the absolute values. put absolute values everywhere. Now, when you put absolute values, you can use Fubini because if everything is non-negative, Fubini always holds. So now you use Fubini. This is equal to, now we will change the integrals, omega two, omega one, off. And here we integrate first in, in x. So f of x, y, 
p of x d mu of x d mu of y. And then you will apply now just Holder in the inner integral. This is less than or equal than the integral in omega 2. The inner integral is an integral in x. Loses to the LP norm of this thing times the LP prime norm of G, which was 1, then the integral in y. And this is where you wanted to arrive. Aha. So you see, in a beautiful proof of Minkowski's inequality for integrals, you use three core things in this course. Duality, Fubini, and Holder. That's the proof. Go and write down in your exercise, in your homework. Let's now go back to my situation. We were investigating the LP norm of this approximation of the identity. We evaluated this pointwise, and we took the LP norm and we arrived at this big expression. It's an LP norm of something inside. There are two measure spaces here. Both are in RD, the integral in dx and dw. By the Minkowski's inequality that we just proved, you can pass the LP norm inside and change the order of integration. This is what it does. You move the LP norm inside and change the order of integration. So this will be less than or equal than the integral in Rd. In Rd. When I do the integration in x first, I'm going to be integrating this function. Okay. So let me wf minus f. Uh, x to the p, the x, this whole thing here, the 1 over p, and then the rest is outside. This is the other measure, p of w dw. This is the measure in 2. In other words, this is equal to, the, this is the LP norm of the function tau epsilon w minus of f minus f, the LP norm. Now the integral is in w, okay? And you are integrating. This is a, a number that depends on w. And of course, epsilon, right? Uh, now it's the moment to use, again, you want to move, remember, we wanted to investigate the limit of these things when epsilon goes to zero. So at this point, you are here at the limit when epsilon goes to zero. A limit is trying to enter your integral. You have to use one of your convergence theorems. How many do you have? Two dominated convergence and monotone convergence. Does anything here look monotone to you? No. So then you have to use dominated convergence. You have to show how this integral, when epsilon goes to zero, is dominated by somebody. Well, here you have it. The LP norm of a translation minus f this always, by triangle inequality, loses to the LP norm of this plus the LP norm of this. Well, the LP norm of any translation is just equal to the LP norm of a function. So this is just two times the LP norm of a function. This is bounded by two times the LP norm of a function times phi. Now, this is a function of w. This is bounded by a number times phi. This is your function that dominates this because phi is integrable in the statement of the result. So you have by dominated convergence theorem that this limit, you can move the limit inside. Okay, so this is the integral of Rd of the limit when epsilon goes to zero of this thing. And what is this limit? you will use again a non-trivial and important fact that you proved, that for any fixed w, for any fixed w, what is this limit? Well, if I fix w and send epsilon to zero, this is just a translation in the LP norm. And my p was not infinity in the statement of the theorem. So this goes to zero pointwise. Okay, so this is just zero. I'll let the proof of number two for you to prove at home. 
okay? And I want to conclude the class today just stating the final result of this course, and I'll let you read the proof at home, which is our final theorem today. We, show, we talked about the LP convergence. There is another important result, which is the pointwise convergence. This is harder to prove. I'll let you read the proof at home, but I just wanted to write down here the statement, which is very beautiful. That's the following. So you let, again, your function phi be in L1 of Rd, okay, with the integral of this function phi being A. Now, assume that this function phi that you chose in the beginning loses in absolute value to a function psi, with this psi being an L1 function and radial decreasing. So we'll, you have to assume that your function phi, whatever it does here, it loses to a radial decreasing function, which is still integrable in absolute value. Assume that it has a radial decreasing majorant, an integrable radial decreasing majorant. The claim is if your function f belongs to LP of Rd, now with any p, one less than or equal than p less than or equal than infinity, you can include infinity here if you want, then f convolution with this function, phi epsilon, limit when epsilon goes to zero of this will be, okay, maybe I should say this, this converges to a f as epsilon goes to zero pointwise almost everywhere, okay? In fact, it converges for all x in the, what we call, the Lebesgue set. So all these things are interconnected, you know? Remember the Lebesgue set where the Lebesgue differentiation theorem holds. So this is the, the set where the Lebesgue differentiation theorem holds. So for all x in the Lebesgue set, which is a set of full measure, you have that the approximations of the identity will converge to a times f pointwise in that set. This is just almost everywhere. It, you cannot make it everywhere. Okay, so this is the pointwise convergence result. I'll let you read the proof of this result at home. I hope you appreciated the class. It was very fun for me to teach you. I mean, I hope we can still be crossing each other here at the ICTP. But I hope that you can appreciate how much you have learned in this class. You know, I, I think you did all very nicely. Keep studying for your final exam. Our final exam is going to be in two weeks. It's going to be Thursday, December 3. Okay, so study hard. Take a look at the notes that I send you, as I said. Uh, take a look at all the theorems. Learn the theorem. Learn how to prove it. Learn how the hypotheses are used. Get the theorem, get a good understanding, but don't memorize the proofs. I'm not going to put in your final exam, state and prove theorem, blah, blah, blah. I am more interested in how you can use this theorem. So you have to see some exercises and do some exercises to see when and how they are used. You have in your homeworks a set of 60 problems, some of them highly non-trivial that you have to solve. Sit down, write your solutions, discuss with me, with Andrea, if they are correct, write down beautifully. And the week before the exam, look at all of these problems, learn what's the core, what are, what's used in each of these problems to kind of recognize the situations where you would use any of the tools that we have learned. Just in the class today, we have used many of the tools that we have learned in this class in a very non-trivial way. So if this was your first class of the course, remember, 15 classes ago, if this was day one, everybody would be looking at it and say, how, huh? what, what, you know. But this is where we should be at this point, you know. Even without knowing you're learning, 
I don't know if uh, you guys saw that movie, Karate Kid, you know. I'm a huge fan of that movie, and I joke with my students that are learning analysis for the first time that uh, what we do here is a little bit about uh, what Mr. Miyagi does with Daniel san in that movie, you know. First, uh, we start teaching you and discussing a little bit of, you know, things that seem random. Okay, why am I learning this thing? Why am I learning this thing? Why am I learning this thing? But then, at the end, when Daniel san asks Mr. Miyagi, he says, I'm not learning karate, you know. You're just teaching me how to paint the wall, how to paint the things, how to, you know, walk the car. And they said, yeah, you're learning, but you don't know it yet, you know. And then he, ask him, he asks him to do the moves, you know. Show me painting the wall. He says, ha, ha, you know, like this, this and that. This is you here in this class, you know. You have been learning lots of basic things, but with, when combined, they have very, very strong power to prove very non-trivial things, you know. And you will take this to the future with you. So keep that in mind, you know. Learn well all of the things that we did in class and take this with you for the next semester for the analysis class that you will take, functional analysis, PD. I'm, I'm sad that it's not going to be with me. I, I know that you wish it could to have more suffering in the homeworks, but you have to know many people here and get to know different styles too. So, okay, I hope you enjoyed the class. It's been almost two hours and I have three minutes to get to lunch and so do you all. Let's finish here today. Let's talk over lunch. Bye-bye, everyone. It was a real pleasure. <laughs>